Next we'll look a little deeper at the tools that are available to us inside Mudbox, how to use them and switch between them, and also discuss best practices for workflow within Mudbox. We'll begin then in Mudbox and we'll start by using a simple plane to get us going here. So we'll click on plane and that'll start me with a standard primitive to use. Now just as a reminder I'm using a graphics tablet here because it's going to make life much easier for me uh, as I start to sculpt this. Now let's begin by looking at the standard sculpting tools. Now I'm going to use the standard sculpt brush and straight away the initial problem you can see here is that my brush is just way too big. So let's come over to the properties panel on the right and lower down the size of my brush to something a little bit more realistic. This is a very unintuitive way to work though, just going back and forth here. So the good news is that you can actually use the Photoshop keys and just do the square bracket keys. So the, the right square bracket key is going to enlarge my brush and the left square bracket key is going to make it smaller. That's much, much easier for us to get started. As I sculpt on the surface then, you'll notice that I've got some variation going on here. I can do thin strokes and thick strokes, and that's very much due to the pressure sensitivity on my tablet. Now, by default, your strength is probably going to be somewhere around here. Let's try increasing the strength. And there you go, we, we're getting some pretty um, intense results here, which is interesting. So strength and size can both be controlled here. Now, when you're working on a something like a face for example, it can save you time to work over the uh, image with mirroring turned on. And You'll see mirroring here. If we select along X for example, you can see that I've now got kind of two cursors that kind of dance with each other. And as I work on one side, you'll see that it matches on the other side. And what's really cool is that you can mirror in multiple directions. So let's go to Y. Well Y is going to be up and down. So let's go to the Z axis. Now we're getting up and down. So now I can go this way and I've got mirroring like that. So that's very neat. But for the time being I think I'm going to leave this turned off. Stamp images, we'll talk more about that later. What I would like to do though is come down to pen pressure. So you'll see right now that I've actually got mine set to 20%. And what that's saying is that uh, on the lightest touch on my pen I'm going to see the size of my brush at 20%. So you can see that's 20% of the size of my brush. And when I push really, really hard, I get my brush at 100%. Now, this is similar to, to uh, well, Photoshop, where you can set both the transfer and size characteristics uh, according to pen pressure. Now, minimum strength, I like to set down to zero because I do like to have that variation in strength. However, minimum size, to be honest with you, Unless I'm doing something like skin creases or whiskers, I typically leave this at 100%. And that way, I know that the brush size I've picked is the brush size I'm going to get. I can vary the strength, in other words, how much it comes out of that canvas, how much it pulls the surface out. So if I start light and then heavy, and get like this, you can kind of see some variation there. Let's exaggerate that a little bit by increasing the strength start light and then heavy. And you can see the variation there on my surface. So as I'm moving this and sculpting it, I'm actually pulling or protruding the surface out. And you're, you're really building up that surface. So that's basic sculpting really. Let's lower this down to something a bit more reasonable. These settings are very much dependent on the scale of your models. So if you have a huge model that you bring in, You'll probably notice that you have to adjust these and kind of play around with them. Similarly, if you bring in a really tiny model, you'll find that you get into tiny fractions for these values to work correctly. Okay, so the standard brush then will pull out from our canvas. This invert function does what it says, pushes into the canvas instead. And you can see from my lighting what that's doing. One pulls out, one pushes in. Now, again, that's a little clunky. So to be honest with you, I never really use this function. So what I actually do is, if you want to pull out, you just use the pen normally. If you want to push in, just hold down the control button. So control and push inverts that function. And that works for most of the brushes inside Mudbox.
So control push pushes in and regular brush pulls out. In addition to that, you'll find it useful to start smoothing out this detail. Now there is a dedicated smooth brush in order to do this and you can kind of see what it does. Let me enlarge the size of my brush here. You can see I'm really just softening up the edges here. Smooth brush is, is just invaluable when it comes to sculpting. You use it all the time and for that very reason it's kind of already built into the sculpt brush. So when I'm sculpting away let's just continue to put a few more sculpts in here all I have to do is hold down the shift key and temporarily my brush turns into the smooth brush so shift and I'm smoothing and this works with most brushes let go of shift and suddenly I'm sculpting again so it's really easy to switch between sculpting and smoothing just as if you're working on real clay and you're using a knife to cut in and then maybe using your finger to kind of smudge and smooth out those areas I'm sure you'll notice then that the resolution here I'm working with is pretty low and we can confirm that by just tapping the W key to turn on our wireframe and you can see we've actually got a very low poly count here. If I come up to my objects tab and scroll down to find my plane, click on the little plus button by the side of it, you'll actually see that I've got three levels of subdivision going on here. Now what is subdivision? Well that's the power of Mudbox. Now the default plane gives you three levels and let's talk about that. So I'm actually working on level two and it shows me that I have 1600 faces going on here. So 1600 quads. Now what I can do is I can actually selectively move down my subdivision levels to simplify this surface. And the way I do that is to hit the page down key. So page down and then that takes me to level one, shows me I've got 400 polys page down again and I'm at the lowest level 100 polys so this is typically where you would start if you bring in a model from another application in this case though the default uh, plane in Mudbox gives us these three to work with so if I'm at level three let's page up on my keyboard incidentally if you're on a Mac and you're using one of those condensed keyboards you might not see the page up or page down keys on your keyboard it's actually just holding down the function key in the bottom left hand corner and tapping up will be page up so function key and the down arrow key will be the uh, page down so that's how you can step up and down the subdivision levels what I would like here though is to have some more detail to work with so we need to add more subdivision levels in the way we do this is, well, there's two ways to do it. We can either go to the Mesh menu, and here you'll see Add New Subdivision Level. If we click on that, you'll see that I've added a third level, or a fourth level, level three, and that gives me 6,400 faces to work with. My wireframe here has got that much more dense, and now I'm going to start to see more detail. Let's go crazy and add another level. Rather than going through the menu, I like to use the shortcut key, which is just Shift and D. So Shift D gives me another level, 25,000. Shift D gives me another level, 102,000. Shift D, 409, so nearly half a million polys. Let's do one more. That gives me 1.6 million polys on this plane. And you can see that my wireframe has got incredibly dense. Be careful here. You don't want to add too many subdivision levels because it's very much dependent on the speed of your machine and how much RAM you have. In addition to that, whenever you save out really dense models, you'll notice that your file sizes get larger and larger. So you can already see here that I'm using more memory um, and my frame rate is going to drop as I move around. But it, you know, it's been optimized. It's it's really what Mudbox does well. So even though I'm using 1.6 million polys here, you can still see that I'm getting some fantastic feedback here. All right. Well, this is how you step up and down the levels, but we'll talk more about how you should really use the levels later on. Um, for now, though, let's turn off our wireframe by hitting W, and let's start to explore what we can do with this. Now we have an incredibly high resolution mesh. So again I can page down my mesh to get right back to the lowest subdivision level and you'll see all that detail that I sculpted has disappeared and page up to get right to the top. 
and all that detail comes back and sharpens up. Now when I start to use very very fine brushes and in fact let's go to our sculpting properties by clicking on the sculpt brush and for the time being let's lower down the minimum size for pen pressure maybe to 20% or so. Now you can see what I can do here. I can start to add some really fine detail. Let's make this a little smaller and perhaps lower my strength a little bit. It's a little high, maybe five. What's going on here? Why am I getting dots? Well, I'm moving my brush pretty quickly. And really, this is very similar to Photoshop again, in that you're actually not really drawing a line. You're stamping a brush multiple times, just like in Photoshop and you can adjust the spacing that that brush stamps. So that's how you can get different shapes and sizes of brush and effectively use them just like a paintbrush because you're just stamping a pattern. So let's come down our brush properties here and let's look at stamp spacing. Let's turn that on and right now you'll see it's set to 6.25. If I lower this right down to zero and then I can move my brush fast again now I'm getting lines again. The brush is going to respond that much quicker and it's going to give me tons and tons of stamps. A lot of that though is dependent on the frame rate and the speed of my machine. So be careful, especially when you're working at very high resolutions. If you set that stamp level right down, you get beautiful results, but you start to lessen the performance of your sculpting. So for now, I'm going to leave it at zero because it's working just fine. What I'm going to do is increase the size of my brush with the right square bracket key and maybe hold down shift and let's start to smooth this out. Look how difficult that is to smooth out. There's several reasons for that. My smoothing parameters are set by my smooth brush even when I'm using the sculpt tool and holding shift. Let's come to the smoothing parameters and look at the strength. The strength is lower there you'll typically find that you need a higher strength on a finer detail mesh in order for that smoothing to be as predictable as, as it is on low resolution meshes. So at low resolutions, it's much easier to smooth out mistakes. Now, even as I do this on this high resolution mesh, you can see it's taking forever to get this smoothed out. And trust me, it is smoothing it just very, very slowly. And that's why we retain multiple subdivision levels um, as we work. It's still possible to step down my subdivision levels and it's easier then to start smoothing this out. See how much more quickly that smoothing brush starts to respond. And as I step back up again we see traces of that left behind. So it's it's very interesting. You, you kind of see a history of, of what's been done on different subdivision levels so let's move right back up to the top and you can see I can smooth that out now and get rid of those um, those details that I added in. So best practice really is to step up and down the subdivision levels as you work. Let's come right down maybe to level 3 and then I can try and better demonstrate workflow here. In fact why don't we start with a new plane so let's we're going to save this and we'll do a new plane here and we're just going to hit shift D to get right back up to 1.6 million polys and then I'll step all the way down back to maybe let's go right down to level 0 hit W to see how that mesh is not at all dense well, let's try to um, make some big sculpts here this is really how we work in Mudbox when you want to make large changes, you step down your subdivision levels and you can move the mesh around uh, very freely and it's more predictable. If you try and make big sculpts on high-res high meshes, then you tend to get a lot of brush marks left behind and it's, it's less predictable and you, you tend to spend more time cleaning up rather than actually just working. So we step down, let's look at our brush and let's see the size is okay and my strength, well we'll leave it at 5 for now and let's start to pull this up 
and you can see my strength needs to be increased dramatically. Now, another way to do this is to actually hold down the spacebar key. And you'll see this is a new set of menus that they've just introduced to Mudbox. Uh, basically the same controls, but just from one handy location. And what I'm most interested in is either the brush size here, which is the circle. So with space held down, you just click on the circle and drag up or down to change the size of your brush. And then I can also adjust the strength of my brush here. So again, click and drag up or down to adjust the strength of your brush. So spacebar is really useful in that regard. Let's start to pull out this mesh here. You can see I'm making really big sculpts here. And if you like, we can compare this to mountainous terrain or just messing around with the plane in Mudbox. Anyway, we're making some big sculpts. You'll see how this is uh, a little bit erratic in places. If it's too crazy, remember, we've also got that smooth tool. Space, and then you click on this gizmo to lower the strength a little bit, and perhaps lower the size. And with my sculpt tool, I just hold the shift key to activate that smooth. I can just bring these little peaks back in if they're a little bit out of control. So, very, very useful. So I've just made some massive changes to that mesh very quickly. Best practice then is to step up the mesh. Let's go up one level and see what we can do at this level, level one. I'm going to turn off my wireframe. Let's zoom in a little bit. And now I can maybe start to create some valleys and peaks here. So let's hold down the uh, control button and you'll notice that I can start to bring in some detail, but it's a little too too confined. It's it's not uh, giving me enough precision that I that I would really like. So let's step up again, level two. And now I'm getting some more precision. Let's hold shift to try and smooth these areas out a little bit. Okay, it's coming on. Let's step up another level, level three, and let's zoom in a little bit start to work on these little valleys here. So lower my brush with control and mixing between control to cut the valleys and shift to smooth them back out again. Starting to kind of cut a path through here. Perhaps my uh, brush strength is a little too high. You'll notice that the higher the resolution, the less strength you need. Working across more polys, and it, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. So I can keep cutting these through here, smooth, cut with control, smooth with shift. If I want to create some little ledges here, start to do that. And you know what? Not really enough detail to do that. So let's step up, page up to level four. Maybe I'll jump up to level five. That's 102. 102,000 I should say and now I'm starting to to be able to add all this extra detail in here all right it's nothing fancy but you get the idea so it's a little small and in fact what I might do is just come down here and remember I talked about this minimum size value I'm gonna turn that up it's gonna make things a little bit more predictable for me Let's come down a level to smooth this out a little bit. So holding shift. And then back up. And just start to kind of cut cut this detail in here with, with a smaller brush. And that's the general workflow. So nothing too spectacular here, but you get the idea. I started off on a really low level to create the general terrain. Then as I stepped up, I started adding in the detail. Step up, step up, and add in more and more detail. And that's kind of that's the you know the, the general gist of how this is going to work. So right now I'm on the highest level and I'm making some pretty overly drastic changes here. But this is a nice opportunity to start talking about brush orientation. You'll notice that my brush is flipping and moving as I move over this surface. It's actually reorienting itself to the angle of the normals on that surface. 
you'll find that underneath your brush properties if I scroll down here underneath advanced you'll see orient to surface sometimes it's unpredictable so I turn it off and you'll notice that my brush is always flat to the screen when you start using stamps and more complicated brushes you know that's gonna get a little um, you know a little annoying to work with so for the most part I like to leave this turned on orient to surface as it's very very useful and that way you know when your brush angles this way and you click it's gonna protrude in that direction rather than always coming straight out towards the camera what happens then if I'd like to come back and make some rather drastic changes well this is where again we're gonna step up and down the levels so if we look at my little valley that's down here with this strange terrain that I've created here um, we know one thing we could do is switch to the grab brush and the grab brush literally grabs vertices on these polygonal meshes and it pushes it around and you'll notice that you get sort of creases as you do this uh, especially at higher resolution so let's undo that and let's step back down with page down and maybe at level 2 I can use a larger brush and I can start to grab this terrain and make this river a little more extreme I'm just pushing these polys around something like that close it in I can take my mountainous landscape and just push this back a bit like that maybe even smooth it out just a little where I got a bit carried away there with that large edit alright so I've changed up my terrain at a lower level and when I step back up to the higher levels again you'll see it's just shifted these polys around quite nicely uh, even though we did it at a lower resolution it's maintained that accuracy and it's just placed it in that new location as we subdivide and subdivide subdivide so we're at our highest level now and the grab tool is very very useful for that let's zoom in a little bit here and let's talk a little bit about the pinch tool so what if we wanted to change the scale of say this valley here what if we wanted to have that to be more extreme so we can grab our pinch tool and anywhere you see these sort of areas that come together the pinch tool pulls those together quite nicely see how it's just kind of sucking that geometry in and it's making that that line that I created there through there even more exaggerated and again as you run through to higher subdivision levels you'll find that this is a lot more precise and takes a lot longer to kind of uh, act whereas if you did that on a lower subdivision level it's going to be even more extreme but I've pinched those together and I've tightened up those valleys in there using that pinch tool what if I would decided that I wanted to uh, flatten out easily some of these hills that we have well this is where the flatten brush comes in so take that flatten brush maybe orient it here and I think for this purpose I'm going to switch orient to surface back on and you'll notice the flatten brush does exactly what it says on the can gives you these nice kind of flattened off plateaus here so we can kind of flatten off some of these edges we make this a little bit more interesting here as we come down into our valley yeah this isn't going to win any awards for sure but hopefully it's kind of demonstrating these tools so we're making the surface a little bit more interesting so that flatten tool is going to save you a lot of hassle it's more refined than the smooth tool because it's got a, a more specific purpose in the way it flattens it out okay before we get to this tool let's move further on and let's look at the bulge tool bulge tool does exactly what that little icon shows you and takes an area and kind of magnifies it so it kind of bulges it out so perhaps that was too small an area let's take our size remember each size uh, each all of these settings are independent per tool so I've got to take my min size and put it back to 100 and I find myself doing that a lot so say if I were to take a huge area like this and bulge it 
you can see how it's just kind of puffing that out and uh, it's getting a little bit overkill there so I'll probably step back there but you can see how perhaps with a smaller brush we could start to bulge out some of these areas bulge out this mound here the foamy brush is similar but perhaps a little more concentrated uh, it says here the foamy tool is intended for initial shape forming rather than for creating fine detail so similar to the sculpt tool but has a softer feel so if we lower down to a lower resolution it's it's basically like that sculpt tool we were using originally except you know just like the name implies it's it's just a little bit more a little softer a little more foamy the wax tool is interesting the wax tool essentially um, let's move back up here it, it causes your surface to behave well less like clay and more like wax so as you sculpt on this you kind of build these layers and it changes the way the surface feels as you sculpt on it so you get kind of different reactions it's like you're melting layers of wax on, on top of a candle or something like that and you're just building the surface up it's kind of interesting so that's the wax tool the fill tool kind of does what it says if you take an area like this and, and use the fill tool it tries to raise those uh, valleys that are down there and just leave you with kind of a, a, a more filled in uniform surface so you kind of you can lessen the exaggeration that I've got here for example which is kind of useful because my terrain's getting a little crazy the knife tool is interesting in that it's a little bit more like grabbing a knife and jabbing it into the clay and kind of making slits and skin creases and it's a little more refined what I like to do is typically actually leave this min size lower that way I get that thickness variation as I make the cut so you can make cuts into your landscape here using the knife tool let's adjust perhaps the stamp spacing let's lower that down it's gonna make that knife tool more precise you can see how extreme that is so we can adjust our pen pressure, we'll lower that down see how sharp those cuts are so the knife tool is excellent for that and you can see how the ends taper off there the scrape tool allows us to come in and it's a little like holding down control with the standard sculpt tool but you can see we can kinda let's increase our size and also our strength here scrape this away and it's it's like you're able to remove areas of the mesh so all these tools are kind of based off the same general principle except they've kind of tweaked the algorithms and the way that the tools work and come together and some give you sort of softer sort of more fluffy cloud effects and others like this scrape tool you can see it's it's a little more pronounced a little more interesting perhaps some are designed to work better at lower resolutions some work better at higher resolutions a lot of this is just practice just like if you were to uh, start sculpting with real clay um, you know from the get-go you'd have to practice you couldn't typically just jump into it it's like any creative talent so my advice here is really just to experiment with these tools and see what kind of effects you can come up with okay so that's pretty much what I want to say about these initial tools let's move on then let's come back to our sculpt tool and this time let's start talking about stamps you can think of stamps like a custom brush in Photoshop so instead of using this the standard circle you're actually using um, a more complex more interesting image so we'll click on the stamp uh, tab down here and let's pick up one of these images here. Now this one's kind of interesting here. I'll click on this one. You'll notice that I'm on my sculpt tool. The stamp image or use stamp image has been turned on. This is independent according to the tool you're using. So I'm on my say my foamy tool. It's not turned on. If I come back to my sculpt tool, it's turned on. So each of these are independent. That's one thing to remember. When you're finished and you want to turn it off, simply click on the off symbol here under the stamp tab so let's try this guy here now one thing to note before you get started is that stamps are very much dependent on the resolution of your mesh so 
if I were to use my stamp at a very low resolution like this, you see it's pretty nondescript. And that's just because there's not enough polygon data to move around. So we'll go up to a higher resolution, and we'll come in here, and instantly we'll try and use this stamp. Well, that's kind of interesting. Very much like a Photoshop brush. A little extreme though, and it needs some tweaking. So let's undo that, and let's see what we can tweak here. First of all, let's turn down the strength, just like we normally would. And then let's look at our stamp spacing. And that's where you don't want to have a zero stamp spacing, just like you would with a, with a regular brush. Let's increase that stamp spacing, and it pushes those patterns further apart. And instantly, this is starting to have a bit more meaning. So I can play with the pressure as I push harder, and these stamps are kind of very random. Ideal for kind of a, an interesting rock face. You can keep building them up, building them up. Again, you want to be at a high subdivision level, so I'm at my highest here. Keep playing around with these stamps. Let's try a different one quickly. Let's try maybe this guy here. Come up to this area here. Oh yeah, that's more like rock face. Fantastic. So you imagine how hard that would be to do with a standard brush. It would take you a long time. You'd have to zoom in and do all this bit by bit. So stamps make light work of extreme detail in Mudbox. Use them freely. They are fantastic. This section up here is pretty self-explanatory. You can randomize the pattern. So right now, my stamp is... I believe it's changing its orientation according to the stroke of my brush, or the direction of my brush, I should say. Whereas you can randomize it. You can randomize the rotation, the width, the height, the scale, and I believe this guy here is intensity. You can flip the horizontal, flip the vertical, and so this makes for even more random uh, landscape as you come down here. So randomization, again, fantastic. Uh, explore it, use it, it's, it's excellent. So that's a stamp, very useful and fairly intuitive to use. Let's turn off this stamp then and let's talk about stencils. Stencils are similar to stamps except you have extreme control over how they're applied. So for example, if I were to grab this guy here, you can see how the stencil is being sort of um, overlaid on my screen here. And so I can move my canvas around just like I normally would. I can zoom in and out. So if I wanted to add some detail here, let's move our terrain, say, to here. As soon as I start to paint on my terrain, the stamp comes through. Now, again, you can see this is, uh, you know, if you come to the edge of your stamp, you're going to get the edge of your stamp, literally, on your canvas here. But I can readjust repaint. So you can grab any kind of interesting image here. Perhaps if you're uh, doing something a little more unique, a bit more interesting, you can grab some reference imagery and use this to create surface texture on your model. It's really excellent. So, and, uh, in addition to this, you have more control. And you'll notice you've got these little shortcut keys down here. Instead of holding down the Alt key, because I'm using the Maya shortcut keys, I can hold down the S key. With the S key held down, I just tap with my uh, my graphics tablet and I can rotate my stamp around. S key and left mouse button does the rotate, middle mouse button pans it around, and right mouse button zooms in and out. So you have absolute control over how this stamp is being placed on your canvas. And it makes light work of heavy texturing. Hit Q and the stamp disappears and it's no longer being applied. So that's stencils and again to turn them off you just click on the off button there. Alright, briefly then let's talk about fall off. This is fairly self-explanatory but it just changes the way your brush behaves. So if I come over here to a clean section of my canvas the standard fall off is very subtle and you'll see how it kind of gives you this smooth, easygoing brush effect. Something more extreme might be this guy. It's going to have a harder fall off. That's going to give me more of a, 
of a, a bubbly effect. Maybe I'll take off my stamp spacing here. There we go, you can see how that's working. This is giving me a harsher edge there. So, one thing to bear in mind is when people first start off in Modbox, everything sort of starts out very fluffy and um, very kind of cloudy and, and, and soft. Playing around with these fall-offs is a great way to instantly remove that soft effect and you've got these great sharp edges here on your terrain. Something like this, yeah, that's going to give you sort of extreme sharp, harsh edges. So fall off, great to play around with. Okay, so I kind of undid a little bit of that just to kind of get back to where we were. Before we wrap up then, it's very important to address the layers here. And people who are starting out often don't make adequate use of their layers. They're incredibly powerful. Just like Photoshop, except, you know, they can sculpt as well as paint. So, we're on our Layers tab, and we've got two kinds of layers, Sculpting and Painting. This one is for deforming the geometry, this one is for painting surface texture, or color, I should say. Under Sculpt Layers, then, to add a new layer, all you have to do is click on this little New Layer button here. We've added a new Sculpt Layer. Sculpt Layers are fantastic because they allow you to make independent edits across your model. So, for example, you can separate out your processes. You can create your fine detail perhaps around here on one layer and perhaps you use another layer to do your big sculpting and pushing around the landscape. Maybe you add in the water effects and this little uh, creek that's running through here on their own layer as well. Being able to separate out your processes like this makes it so much easier to uh, do trial and error, and also it makes the uh, the sculpting process a little more manageable. So let's start, for example, by working on this top area here. If I zoom in a little bit, and maybe I'll just use a stamp brush, and let's pick up something a little interesting. Let's go with you know, this guy here, and make sure we're on a high subdivision level. We've got some randomizing going on here. And we've also got, let's see, some stamp spacing. There we go. So sculpt layer, I can start to add in detail here on the top ridge. And if I later change my mind and decide, well, that was a complete mistake, I can come back here and I can view it without those additions. So I just scroll over to where the little eye symbol is and uncheck the little circle. So you can make those edits independently of the rest of the mesh, which is fantastic. You can also add in additional sculpt layers by uh, adding another one here. And you'll notice that they're actually sort of additive. So if I perhaps turn off my stamp and Maybe, uh, you know, maybe I'll go towards my bulge tool and I'll kind of bulge the front out here. You'll notice that it's bulged this detail that I sculpted in on the layer below it. If I turn off the layer below, I keep the bulge without the detail. Or I can reverse that, I can turn on the layer below and remove the bulge and get back to where I was. So it's very, very easy to make sort of these independent changes. In addition to that, you can actually adjust the opacity of your sculpt layers, just like you could in Photoshop. So if I decided this, for example, was way too much, I can't undo it because I created it on the main mesh itself and not on its own sculpt layer. Whereas the uh, section that I created on top here, I simply go to the sculpt layer and I can look at the strength here. If I take that slider down, you can see how I can reduce or increase the effect of that. So it's very easy to adjust the subtlety of that sculpting. And again, that is preserved through hiding and showing that layer. If you create a layer and you know you make a bunch of edits that you decide you later don't want and you'll never need again, just simply delete the sculpt layer with the trash can. Simple as that. Most importantly of all though, 
you must remember that sculpt layers are dependent on the subdivision level that you created them at. Now you'll notice here the little 7 showing me that I created this at subdivision level 7. If I switch down a couple of levels and try and edit this sculpt layer, it won't let me do it. I can't click on it. And the reason for that is because it's saved those changes into the vertices that exist on that subdivision level. So be very careful to create the sculpt layers on the correct subdivision level that you intend to be working on. If you've done a load of work and realize it was on the wrong level, but you uh, decide, you know what, I need that, just step down and create a new sculpt layer. And lastly, if you decide that you love those changes and you want to optimize your scene, because remember, each layer that you add is going to add file size and take up more memory, you can simply select the layer that you want to merge down, click on this little arrow here, and you'll notice you can flatten. You select that, and it removes the layer and pushes it down. So that's preserved that detail for good. We can't talk about layers without at least touching on the concept of painting and paint layers within Mudbox. So let's actually utilize some of these paint tools quickly just to see what we can do here and get started with painting. So we can add a paint layer by going to the painting tab and adding a new paint layer in much the same way that you would uh, with the sculpt layer, but it's a little different here because you'll notice that it starts to ask me how I want to create this. You can't paint on a surface of an object without creating a texture to store that paint data into. So we have to give a name to our paint layer. In this case I'll just call it diffuse to mark the diffuse channel. A size, you know, lower sizes, less detail but more efficiency. Higher sizes, more detail, far less efficiency. Try and find a middle ground depending on what you're trying to do. I'll start with the 2K map. I'll save it as a TIFF with an alpha channel and I'll save it into my diffuse channel. Now by working in other 3D applications you'll know that you can define the glossiness or specularity of your surface in individual maps just like you can opacity, displacement maps, bump maps, etc. We're just going to paint color in this example though so we'll just use diffuse. I'll click OK and my diffuse map's been created. So again, you have to create paint layers in order to be able to actually start applying color. Let's click on our paintbrush, scroll to the top. First thing we can adjust is the color of that paintbrush. So for example, if I wanted to paint this area here sort of greenish, click on the color tab, it'll bring up my color picker. We'll go to a sort of a natural green, something like this click done and instantly I can start to apply color here onto my model. You can paint these textures very intuitively. You know, it's far quicker than if you were to take your UV map into Photoshop and start applying this. And again, that doesn't mean that those techniques are done and dusted and, and never going to used again. The truth is this has a very specific purpose and there are reasons to use this just like there are reasons to use traditional texturing techniques. Now speaking of UV maps, let's take a look at our UV tab quickly and you'll notice if I zoom in, you can see where I'm painting this in 2D UV coordinate space and then how that painting is then being wrapped around this 3D object that I have here. We can adjust our paintbrush in much the same way we can adjust other brushes in the sculpt tools. So the minimum size, the pressure, etc. And we can change the fall off. And we can also apply stamps. So if I wanted to perhaps choose sort of a brownish color here, let's go with something, maybe a gray brown like this. I can apply this color with a stamp. Let's put our minimum size to max so that our stamp is a little bit more noticeable. You can kind of see how this is being a bit more varied now. Maybe if I pick something a little more extreme, you'll be able to see that. I'll zoom out and use a larger brush. 
and you can see how I can paint with that stamp. And it's exactly the same with stencils. If you'd like to apply a stencil and literally sort of spray paint through this virtual cardboard stencil, you can do that. Decide where you want to place it. This is kind of cool for rock face. And then just start painting away. And it applies that with the opacity which is in the original stencil. Now it's a little hard to see that when I'm painting on top of this uh, default material with this kind of uh, beige color on it. So what I typically recommend you do when you first start painting is to actually sort of blank the canvas out with white. Now let me quickly delete my diffuse layer to show you how to do that. Let's add a new paint layer. Again we'll call it diffuse and you'll notice if you look at your tools there's no paint bucket. You can't just flood a surface using a tool but it does exist. So if we go to our paintbrush maybe pick a white to blank the canvas out and come down here you'll see this option called flood flood from camera. Simply click on that and you blank out your entire texture that you're working on. You can verify that in UV space. It seems to have glitched out a little bit there but that's okay. So now when I start applying these stencils for example, let's use maybe something like this. And if I were to apply this with a different color, my paintbrush, then your white canvas shows through underneath and it makes it so much easier to see how your stencils are being applied. It's really difficult to, uh, to, to kind of paint accurate texture when you're looking through at this default material which again is just being selected and then you know painted onto that surface. You can change that default color any time but once you've blanked your texture like that it doesn't matter which of these default materials you skip to, the underlying white remains. So that's texturing briefly in Mudbox. Lastly, let's talk about saving out our files and a word of caution. So let me go ahead and save this file, save as, and I'm just going to overwrite this example mud file and click save. And let's take a look where this is saved to. You'll notice that my backup file is being created here. If I refresh this, this file, as simple as it is, is 215 megabytes. So you can see how dense these files are. And as soon as you start adding in more sculpt layers, it gets even more dense. That's pretty small, actually. When you've been working on something for a while, and you get it to sort of up to the 2 and 3 million poly mark, then you can easily uh, exceed a gig on your files. And again, your backup files are going to be large as well. And this is useful. That backup file is smaller because I had less detail and less sculpt layers when I created that. So I can always revert back to this if I need to. Simply delete the original and rename this to a mud file and you're sorted. You'll also notice this example files folder has been created. If I look inside here, this is where my textures have been created. This guy here is actually a little preview which you can see because it's only one kilobyte. This TIFF file here, if I open this up with my uh, Windows Photo Viewer, you can see the TIFF file is the texture that I created. And you can see that, that detail that I painted in there has been saved into that texture. Again, this has been blanked with white because I flooded it from the camera. And this would appear as alpha opacity if I had not done that. So there we go. A very uh, sort of brief look at all the tools that we can start to play with inside Mudbox. We've looked at the sculpting tools, some of the paint tools. We've also explored using stamps, stencils. We've looked at the properties of these tools. And we've also looked at sculpting layers and painting layers to make your workflow that much more efficient. So thank you for watching and have fun using Mudbox.